It is my great pleasure to have here with us today the inimitable Bob Wysocki, a sculptor from the art department at Syracuse University. Yes, you are in the science podium, and yes, he is an artist. Um, I also want to welcome, before we move forward, his wife and his two kids, Jenny, Jack, and Max in the back. And you should know that Jack and Max raised over $20,000 to help with water projects in developing countries in the past two years. Wow. So, and they probably got some help from their parents. <laughs> in any case, um, Bob is uh, hails uh, from California. He got his bachelor's in architecture from UC Berkeley. He then got a master's in fine arts from Yale. He taught for a while, was on the faculty for a while at the University of Nevada, Reno. Las Vegas. Then, huh? Well, if it was Reno, Sorry. I'd still be there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. I do. I say that automatically because I know people at Reno, Las Vegas. And then um, ended up at Syracuse in 2008. Yep. Correct. And his, his big picture approach to art and looking at nature through the lens of art has led him into an intellectual space that is pretty unique that straddles art and science. And that's why he's here today. And he, in 2009, he founded the Syracuse Lava Project, which is the only facility in the world, to my knowledge, correct? Unless it's some huge industrial accident <laughs> that pours lava. Right? Yeah. Uh, where you can melt enough rock to not just kind of sort of simulate a lava flow, but really make a lava flow. And a bunch of the students in here have been up there and done experiments as part of our volcanology class, so they're familiar with the setups. And with no further ado, I will put you in Bob's capable hands. So, the a bit. Oh yeah, I'm on it. Yeah. Just keep going. Um, okay. So, uh, it, it's you got to trust me, it's all going to come together in the end. <laughs> yeah, well, it's going to seem like I'm a little all over. I actually have uh, uh, an equation that has to do with making random things crank into some kind of order. Um, this photograph was taken uh, in October 2nd, 2009, and the next day, uh, this stuff had, this was slag off of an iron furnace, and this is when my life went upside down. Um, because it looked a lot like this. Um, this is just, this is a wax version of it. I didn't cast it. Um, the slag is the impurities that float to the top of a bath of iron, and they come out these little holes called slaggers. And um, the guy that, was, that would, helped us with this asked what I thought of the, the iron furnace. I said, well, the hot iron and everything, that was pretty cool. What is this? And there's a slag. It's nothing. We throw it away. And that, I realized, was something to look at. And what I mean by my life went upside down, it's, I, it was like Alice in Wonderland. I went down that rabbit hole, and I think I'm just now re-emerging six years later. later. Um, so this is where I grew up. This is, uh, um, this is Mount Lassen. It's the southernmost uh, volcano in the Cascade Range in Northern California. These are the Sierra Nevada foothills. This is in mid-March. I grew up on a, on, uh, um, a prune farm. We had prune orchards. And this is what we did. So every morning I'd walk out to catch the school bus. This is what I saw. Um, and it still looks like this, except there's no snow. Uh, of course, in the middle of the drop. Really important photograph. You're going to see it a bunch of times. Uh, and this was the world I inhabited. Uh, um, that's, my father didn't believe in child labor laws. Um, I think <laughs> I'm about 10 years old. I have flip-flops on. I'm on a prune harvester working. And a, a lot of people say, well, you know, you went to Berkeley, you went to Yale, you must, that's where you learned all these things. I learned pretty much 99% of what I know, how to, like, improvise in the moment from being on the farm. My father hated uh, repairing things, and he taught me how to weld at a very, very early age, an unsafe age. And um, <laughs> that's, that's uh, how I know a lot of things. So, again, <clears throat> this is this image that's burned into my head. The last time this, this erupted, um, was it's still it's dormant. It erupted uh, last time was May 22nd, 1950. So just over 100 years ago, right? That's what it did, and that's what it would have looked like if you were two miles further west, three miles further west of where I lived across the Sacramento River. 
I felt completely cheated by this. <laughs> I wanted this when I was growing up. I mean, I really wanted that. And you'll see this image in a lot of uh, geology 101 textbooks of, of this thing going on. Pretty significant event. And it blew out the backside of the mountain just like Mount St. Uh, Helens did um, in 1980. So, it, but this is what I was left to look with, which is not a, a bad thing. And you know, I was in this world. And then I went here, which was, um, even though it was three hour drive, I might as well have been out on Pluto. I grew up, I had no idea there were that many people, different kinds of people in the world, and I was blown away. So I moved into a program that, had, that was housed in this, basically a parking garage that was converted into a school building, and this was the architecture program. Um, and then I ended up straight out of architecture school. This is the National New Nuclear Directed Energy Research Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. I helped design this building. Um, those that are probably over 30, 35, remember the Reagan Star Wars initiative. This building, it, it, the program had been canceled, but this building was this quarter billion dollars already in the pipeline. This is where they design. Uh, um, and work on different parts of space-based uh, nuclear um, weapons. <laughs> and it's not as soul-sucking as you would think. It was um, fascinating. I met some really intelligent people. And I, I learned a tremendous amount about materials. I was that guy in the meeting when they would talk about an incident and they didn't need doors out in hallways. And I said, you mean an explosion? And um, they were, it was a very button-down thing. Around this time, so this is 1990, end of 1990, I meet this guy on the left here in the lovely evening gown, and this was my first exposure to art, literally, other than some, <coughs> some painting, the art museum in Berkeley, which I, did, I went to just a couple times. Uh, I am, <coughs> this is a, a short, we're, we're re reenacting the Chanel ad, and I was a football player, Jim Otto, from the Oakland Raiders in the 1960s, late, early 70s. And he is this ideal version of, of, of beauty. Um, he's probably one of the most famous artists in the world now. His name is Matthew Barney. And if you're a fan of Bjork, her last album was all about their divorce. And, uh, he gave me license to act on any idea I could possibly think of. I mean, you can tell, right? Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea when he asked me to come back to New York. Why don't you be in some videos? I had no idea, and I'm not even showing you the good stuff, uh, like the good stuff. Um, this was uh, this is my introduction, but he he really pushed me, um, and he was 23 at this time, and he was doing crazy out of box stuff. This was one of the ideas he really pushed me to get act on. Um, this is where I was trying to be confused as roadkill with roadkill. You can see it here in the foreground. Um, we went and collected dead animals and laid next to them for eight hours. And uh, uh, kind of one of the people I, I really look at a lot is a guy named Chris Bird. He recently passed away, an artist who had himself straight out of grad school. He had uh, himself shot in the arm in front of a, a, a gallery audience. Um, as his, his work was all about early on, was, was engaging the gallery, the viewer, more than just they come in and look at your work. And he actually had a guy come out and shoot him in the arm. And from Matthew and from Chris, and I met Chris Bird when I was in grad school, um, their thing was you've got to immerse yourself in whatever you're doing. That's what I mean by my life went upside down six years ago. I got a little over immersed in the whole lava thing. It, it really is, uh, it's, a lot of my colleagues think I'm crazy. Um, they don't see the art in this, but we'll get to that later. Uh, my father drove out after about seven and a half hours, drove out here and he asked me, what are you doing? I don't think he was, he wasn't asking me like, what am I doing out there? I think it was like, what are you doing with your life? Yeah. Um, and it was around this time that he was, so this is the last piece I did before grad school, 1993, summer 93, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and which is a death sentence. And I was having been raised in the Catholic church and you get this idea of the savior and this, the righteous life and, and like who's protecting who? And I thought about the scarecrow. Where the hell is the scarecrow? And so I was out, I was a scarecrow, I had my best friend, because only your best friend would do this for you, lashed me to a post and beam 14 feet in the air. It's a bad idea. Um, and I didn't scare any crows away, there were no crows. 
and it was, and I also didn't, only one uh, uh, buzzard flew over me because um, there was a bunch of dead animals down the road where it was a banquet and I was this thing. So just before I go to grad school, I have to move back to the farm from San Francisco where I'm, I'm working in this architecture firm. And uh, I take care of the farm. And I never understood what my father's affinity was for the farm. I hated it. I hated working there. Because when I was in high school, my friends were out on the river in the summer or out doing stuff. And I was, I was on the farm. And it was his thing, and I didn't get it. Having to take it over for that summer and get it prepared for somebody else to harvest it for my mother um, with his eventual passing, I got it. I mean, I got I got, he was immersed in that manipulated nature, but he was immersed in it, and I, I got it on an a incredible level. So I go uh, from this, and I end up here. This is a four and a half day drive, but I th it was a galaxy away. I got to Yale and was just blown away. Um, I was the only non-art major in the program. I didn't know how to speak their language. Um, I, I, it, it was a really, it was a weird time, and but I got a tremendous amount out of this, and um, mainly I learned how to, I learned how to do research here. I learned how to really uh, go deep into a subject. So I moved to Hollywood um, after this. So I wasn't ready to move into New York City, which is pretty much you go to Yale, do your master's in sculpture, and then you move to New York City. And I had an apartment offered up to me in a studio, and I did. And I moved to Hollywood instead, and I made commercials and videos. Those that are 35 or older know who this is. Some of you, the most of you don't know who this is. It's Pamela Anderson. Um, and I had things like I was trusted to like wrangle her for a day for this music video. Um, she's a lot more intelligent, a lot more on the ball than, than she's portrayed or she portrays herself. Um, but I made crimes against culture. Low budget films, commercials, videos. And I realized I was making other people's art and I got out and I was the first employee of a toy company called Zoo, which stood for zoology, ontogeny, ontological, and botany, and, uh, or biology. We didn't want to put the zoo, parenthetical two, next to it. Um, it was a building uh, toy, plastic building toy. These are two and three eighths inches long. And uh, you could accurately model DNA as well as we built an accurate two scale model of the Golden Gate Bridge out of this stuff. Amazing toy. Unfortunately, there was three MFAs and one uh, lawyer running it. And then the people who gave us money to make it happen wanted the MBAs in there, and it got ugly. And I was, we came to a mutual <laughs> agreement that I would leave because I was, yeah. So I'm 34, and I get, I, I leave, and I'm unemployed, highly educated, but I'm unemployed. And so, Logically, I'm going to go back and get a degree in mathematics and physics. <laughs> so, uh, this is the equation about uh, randomness being, you know, trying to quantify randomness. So, I moved back to Northern California, uh, up from San Francisco, just 30 miles uh, south of where I, uh, and I enrolled in these classes. And I realized actually studying, uh, sitting in the calculus classes and the, the mechanics and the electromagnetism and the light classes, uh, um, that it was, uh, I, I had begin to get this relationship between, <coughs> at this real high level, art and science and religion, philosophy, all are using the same language. It's just, you're dropping in some other words here and there. But it's all these same, it's these big ideas. Looking for, looking for either the smallest thing or the whole thing. And I realized I got a lot closer to this. So, I mean, a really quick history lesson. Um, there's, there's been a pursuit of trying to encapsulate or, or portray the sublime for centuries. This is Ansel Adams. He was a transcendentalist in the, in the same vein as Wal, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He would go out, set his camera for four or five days, not take a single photograph. He would wait for this to paint itself into this perfection. Days he would spend out there. And he was, so the same as Ralph, uh, although Emerson is, he was um, very much in the individuality of who he was, but his spirituality was trying to find God in nature. 
and that union was made in nature. Same with the German landscape painters from the late 1700s up until uh, the late 1800s. This was 1865, Albert Bierstadt, who went on the expeditions uh, out west in the Sierras, um, and he would, he would stay and paint. And he was doing the same thing. This is a classic painting of, of uh, landscape painters literally trying to paint God. <coughs> Most of these guys were Catholic. Um, or had a, had a relationship with the Catholic Church in some way. Literally are trying to paint God. <coughs> Thomas Cole, Hudson River Valley, paintings, uh, School of Painting. It's just this group of this idea and these, all these painters are painting the same stuff. Same thing. This is the Oxford, 18, 1840. Probably one of the most important paintings in history is The Wanderer Above the Mist. This is in Hamburg, Germany. It's more important than the Mona Lisa. This is, uh, will never travel. If you're ever in Hamburg, Germany, you should go see this. Um, it is Caspar David Friedrich. It's one of the classic images of the sublime. It's the first time this was scandalous when he painted this in 1818, I believe it was. Scandalous in that the character, this main, this, this, uh, what the focus of the painting is supposed to be has his back to us. You don't know what he's thinking. You don't know if he's like, it's his uh, supremacy over nature or his inferiority to nature, the abyss. Um, there's literally, literally dozens of linear feet of books written about what this painting means. And he, never tipped, he never tipped his hand to what it was. Amazing painting. You'll see this again. So, I start out, this was my, this was my, I started interested in not so much the sublime, because that's a big thing to take on, the grand unification theory, or, uh, uh, or you're looking for like that, in, you know, whatever the smallest thing is, they're looking at, uh, at, at, at CERN. And I went back just to think about the landscape. And this is the landscape I grew up in. So I took that, and I started making these metal things that I considered landscape paintings, and this is how we irrigated our orchards. The water would come here, flow across here, up, flow up this Cartesian uh, grid. And I, I would spend hours up there. Actually, my father would send me out there when I was nine or ten years old. And these ridges, these big long things, were about this tall, made out of soil. And every four weeks, you'd have to form these up with a tractor. And I would lay out there with my feet pointing towards the uphill part of the orchard where the water was coming from. This is at night. And uh, I'd wait, I'd be three or four trees in, I'd wait till if I fell asleep, the water would hit my ankles. And then it was time to go up and, and move the water to the next row that needed to be irrigated. Um, I was lucky. I think I had an incredibly charmed uh, childhood. So I started making these things. These things are 300% uh, larger Tonka trucks. They're the same size to me now as they were when I had my earliest memory, which is around, that I could, they still hold around two years of age. So this guy's like six and a half feet long. And if I go to pick it up, I have to throw my whole back into it, just as a two-year-old would have to do with the real one, with the real Tonka. This was about memory. This is about memory of the landscape. This is about manipulating the landscape. This long blue one here is 22 feet long. Tonka didn't make that. They did, though, make a, a Winnebago that they were trying to break into the Barbie market in the early 70s. And I always wanted a Winnebago. My parents were, we're not mother own. We're not mother own people. They did not make a single white trailer. Um, so then I tried to get smarty pants about making art, and I cast that original pattern, that other pattern I had, in solid paint, which was not easy to do. This fell flat, and I realized it, it stripped it of all the soul I wanted it to have, and this was just this academic argument, landscape painting, it's paint, and it was stupid. And I went back to drawing books. This was work that I was introduced to. Now, this is current uh, land art. This thing is Spiral Jetty, Great Salt Lake, <coughs> that um, recently emerged because the level of the lake lowered. That's uh, a third of a mile long. That's the width of a, of a, of a dump truck. And it's um, Robert Smithson's work. You can actually go there. It's a pain to get out there, but it's cool once you get out there. This thing's about ready to open. This is uh, Michael Heiser's. Uh, city complex. This across here 
is a little under a quarter mile. This is a mile and a half. It's the largest piece of art uh, ever made. We're talking bigger than what the Egyptian, right? If you want to call that it, it's not art. But this is actually a, There's been three generations of family, uh, of one family who are all video equipment operators working on this for the last 35 years. Um, it is crazy. Um, and I, I started gravitating more towards this work. This is about three hours north of Las Vegas, two and a half hours north of Las Vegas. Still isn't open yet. Um, this is the road and crater. This is James Terrell's work. This is essentially like a... Well, it's a, it's a steep volcano that he took and he's reshaped the top of it. And there's a structure that he's built in there that uh, certain days of the year, things are going to line up. And this is, was open for a few days in May, and this is almost <coughs> ready to be open to the public. You'll be able to go there and see this thing. But it wasn't that. And I'm really, uh, I, I, want, I want to find this space. I can't do it with this little laser. I want to find out what this space is for him that way. So this is the Amargosa Dune. Amargosa Valley Dune, this is about 90 minutes north of Las Vegas on the, the highway that connects Reno to Las Vegas. My wife and I would pass by this four times a year, up and back at Christmas, up and back uh, during the summer to go back to my family's farm. This is about a little over a mile long, maybe a third of a mile wide, up to five or 600 feet tall. Depends. It's, I would stop every time and look at this. And finally, I don't know, it was fifth or sixth time, She's like, what? <laughs> she also has a degree in art. I mean, she's, as I told the students earlier, much, much smaller than mine. Um, I said, you can't paint this, you can't photograph it, you can't take a video, and there's nothing about like translating the beauty of this thing that seems to hover out this valley, and you start to read, um, who wrote the physics of blown sand? Blowing sand. Anyone? It's a Bible written in 45, 19, or, or 19, late 30s. It's a physics of blowing, of blowing sand. Anyway, I can't remember the guy's name. When you read about sand dunes, it's so remarkable that they exist at all because the conditions have to be perfect for this grain size to be deposited in there in this quantity. And these things migrate back and forth. They move. It's a very alive thing. It's amazing. So she said, I said, you know, what can you do? No one comes out here. You should make it. So I went to Home Depot and I bought some sand. The problem with this sand is it's manufactured. It does not know how to be a sand dune. This was a week of having air blown on it, and it took this shape because it has to. But it didn't do much. It wasn't very articulate. Whereas when you go out and actually, it's illegal to take sand out of national parks. But I collected all this in five-gallon buckets. 10,000 pounds. Uh, and... This literally, within hours, took the shape. Not the, sh not the over big shape, but the, the articulation on the surface. This is a bark and dune. If you take a, a pile of sand, you dump it from one point out, it's going to make a cone that has the, the sides are going to be 31.2 degrees. That's the angle of repose. It's all the steeper it can get um, if it's dry sand. And if you have a constant flow, airflow over that doesn't change direction, this is the only shape it can take. They see these on Mars. There's in a valley in Peru. Um, Mojave Desert, little ones, but not big ones. These things migrate back and forth. 100,000 pounds of Florida sand. Um, that uh, I didn't have to steal this. I rented it for 50 bucks from a garden center. <laughs> But the guy with the bobcat, the guy that ran the guy, we had a friend that worked at an equipment rental place, and he let us use this bobcat for free. And he goes, if you don't bring it back by Friday, abandon it on our road, and we'll consider it stolen. Because <laughs> every Saturday morning, they do an inventory check in the yard. And this is not always how I work, but it's convenient. Um, <laughs> this is uh, Huntington Beach. These things actually look with time, with, with, uh, time lapse photography. The little bark, and these are called solitons, actually looks like it migrates through it. 
What happens if this is on the upland side, grains of that little one hit this, and it bounces like it, it, it conserves, I don't say, okay, I'm not going to break laws of physics, but it conserves this energy of it. And these things seem to like go through, migrate through these things, when in fact, that sand that would have been on the right would be in the, in the face, not face, but the, uh, I can't think of the name now, would be in the dune, and it kicks off sand and forms this thing back. Crazy. It's perfect. This is currently up in Toronto, University of Toronto. Um, I made four of these. Um, people really like them. They brought me a little closer to this. So now we're back to October 2nd, 2009, this iron pour. <coughs> I think I'm right here. I'm right here with the red helmet on. I'm holding this ladle. We're actually pouring hot iron into a hollowed out log. This is called a reaction mold, and it shoots all, because it turns that wood to gas, and it, it, the fuel in there, and it all comes back out. It's a bad scene. I've never been burned to any of these, but it's not good. So the next morning, I find this thing. This is actually really what it looked like, and I made this one out of wax, and this is what ruined my life, um, because I thought, of the sand dunes, lava flow. I mean, it is these geomorphically accurate things. And it's this, right? We'll get close to that. So we we're pouring little amounts. It wasn't going to be this because this is what I wanted. Sure as hell wasn't going to be this because I really want this. And this was like crazy. Like, I don't need, and we weren't going to get to that. But we were able to do some stuff that previous research, this is Tracy Gregg's work and her advisor, she's at the University of Buffalo. She came up with a way of using a certain kind of wax in a tank of glycerin to model lava flows. <clears throat> Um, it breaks down after 25 to 30 degrees slow. It, wax does something else the lava would never do. And then these are, you can see one centimeter, very small samples. You can't do much with like, really how it flows. Um, in 1976, not that long ago. I mean, it's forever ago for you guys, but most of you guys. <coughs> this was ours. Uh, there is a, <laughs> we've identified a crystal <laughs> in here. Um, it was one of our crystals. And, uh, that was the first um, micropope image of lava that we poured in January of 2010. So I study, I study, we're pouring little things like this. It was ridiculous. And it, it, this thing is like, it's a cow pie. And uh, um, I see this lava thing, and I, for two weeks I try to figure out, like, okay, I knew it could hit the temperatures in our furnace. How, what, what material do I put in? Do I just go in the driveway and scoop up sand? Two weeks later, I go find Jeff Carson, who's my colleague, and our science is there. And he does, it's always, you can ask your professors, there's this, uh, act of this professional courtesy, somebody from the art department or some wackadoodle from down the way shows up. You gotta give them a few minutes, because usually they wanna know, can you suspend gravity in this gallery for like two seconds, that's all I need. <laughs> <laughs> and, they're like, and they always tell you, I got, in two minutes now, I got a meeting, I gotta be out of here. Jeff said that, I didn't get out of his office for 90 minutes, because he realized I knew what I was talking about. He said, you know, nobody's done this. So get closer to this, but I realized I, I needed to go big. So I go to this, and this was seemed like such a great idea at the time. I paid 2500 bucks for this thing, which was just scrap metal up in Canada, rebuilt so it looked like this. Now we could pour upwards of 750 to 800 pounds. Um, we really didn't know what we were doing. Still, when we had it, it was a nightmare. Um, now this thing, I know everything about. I know where to kick it when it grounds, like and make it go. It's I used to baby this thing. Here I am, like this is how much we didn't know working lava. I have a garden hoe, and I'm working with lava with a garden hoe. <laughs> I can't believe I have this photograph. And I saw it last night. I'm like, yes, I want to show how stupid. Like how we just didn't know what we were doing. This hoe actually just got sacrificed the first time we tested the bigger furnace. I'm going to show you on accident. It just disappeared and about two minutes later there was a little trickle of steel that came out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but we did it. This video, I, I'm, I think if I can minimize this somehow, I want to exit the show. A lot of you have seen this. Um, this video. If it's going to play, of course it's not going to play. Okay, I'm going to find a way of playing at least one really important video for you. Let me get out of this. Holy cow. 
every video on the desktop just opened. Um, <laughs> that's not good. We'll go back to the program here. And where were we? Here we were. This, so, and I go back up here. Sorry. Presenter view. Okay, so this was the first time we poured and everything happened the way it was supposed to happen. The lava came out over the ice. You can see this on my Vimeo page. Just If you Google Vimeo and my name, you'll see all these videos come up. And it's about a foot thick block of ice, four feet wide, 12 feet long. And the lava just bubbled over the top of it and it rode on this cushion of steam, insulated itself, and just kept going. And then finally there was this, this where there was a crack in the ice towards the bottom of this block and it exploited that. It dove down and it was gone. But you point this out. This is a wood box. Like, we're going to be smart. And like, oh, lava's well, going to stay. Like, we had, these things would catch on fire. A block of ice with, in a wood box, the box would be on fire. The lava would be flying off. It gone off the side. It was. <clears throat> so we got pretty good at doing stuff like this. This is how we make, I can make a lava tube now uh, in Pahoya. We can make Pahoya all day long. Um, here you go. Difference in slope. Illustrated really well. Um, this is Inot Lev's research. Um, she's a geophysicist at, at Lamont Doherty uh, Earth Observatory, which is managed by Columbia University. She, she is an early supporter and believer in what I was doing. Um, this was to try to attempt to, to do Tracy Gregg's experiments with this difference of slope, 30 degrees. But it just bulldozed the dry sand off of the wet sand and made these giant bubbles. And everybody was like, oh, it's arts. And I was like, no, this is not what I'm looking for. <laughs> now, I live a mile away from the university, uh, my house. My family does. I say. And uh, I was there. So I would take time off for these important father-son activities, like teaching them to drive in the parking lot. Um, so it wasn't that absentee. Even though my wife did say, I think I'm going to start referring to you as an uncle. That way, you know, it's, it's easier that way. Um, here's some other stuff. I had to buy a FLIR camera, a forward-looking infrared camera. There was a lot of money, and I got a lot of, a lot of like, why, university, uh, why are you buying a $12,000 camera? Because I had to be able to guarantee what the temperatures were of the lava. Because when we were first making it, we were pouring it too hot. <coughs> lava tube, big lava tube, real lava tube, our lava tube with ceiling features. Um, I have a couple of these in my office. Pillows. I'm going to skip this. Um, God, if I could. Okay. This, i got to figure out how to get out of. Um, no, I didn't want to do that either. Now, if I think, if I mirror the display, I'll be okay, right? Okay. Oh, God. Here we go. Sorry, this was all worked out three hours ago, and then I lost it all. Of it. Okay, so um, I want to show you pillow. Oh, this is just a shh. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Now we have them all open. <laughs> so they'll be ready to go. Holy cow! I mean, this thing. I think volcano. This was yesterday. We tried this yesterday. If it's gonna play. We tried to actually make a volcano out of a vent. This is for an honors course they teach. <coughs> and really, we need more time so this stuff cools and begins to stack up. We know we need more volume. Um, that was yesterday. That's what you would, if you were in my class yesterday, this is what we'd be doing. And I knew it was going to do this, but I let the students fail anyway. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, that's the only way they, you know, if I've seen this stuff so many times, I pretty much tell you what it's going to do. This is the first time trying to make an underwater lava tube. A couple of years ago, I think it was only eight or nine degrees outside. It was terrible. We're outside with the giant water tank. Totally fascinating how it worked. Here we go on the bottom. Now, again, I think we need more volume. I think we need a slope in there. And um, we need a bigger tank. Uh, we'll get rid of this guy. Lava on ice. This will be a quickie. Right? This is the first video that went viral. Um, Syracuse gets about 3 million hits a year on their website. The last three years, I've gotten um, over 100 million. 
<laughs> and there's some people over there that don't think that's a big deal. It's like, okay, it's not Psy and Gangnam Style, but it's, but it ain't your 10 million hits. Um, okay, so, oh, this was pretty good. This was stupid. This is incredibly dangerous. I didn't realize until a part, I was in, into this part way how dangerous it was. That's me next to the vent, keeping it clear. Well, I wanted to make that Vesuvius right. You want this stuff up in the air. My wife filmed that. I mean, so she's in on this. <laughs> Yeah, uh, because this is what I was really interested. I w I really want to make this, and I thought, okay, I'm going to do it in these mini these baby steps. But now I think I can actually get close to this. Um, where are we here? I don't want that one. Okay, I'm not ready to show you that one or that one. I think we're just about ready to go back. Oh, goodness. Okay, so we're going to go back to PowerPoint here. And I think I can just go straight to the, this action here, right? So you saw the cannon. Um, yes. So you saw the cannon. And so we did all those things, right? And then we hauled the thing out to the desert. We were 23 miles north of the, the closest power supply. So we had to convert everything to, to, from natural gas to propane and generate... This was for a BBC thing. Some of you earlier were asking me why I, the media thing. Um, I just turned down Discovery Channel for a thing next week because they wanted to do a real dry... That's why I was asking about dry ice. They want to flow. They want to do a big flow on a big piece of dry ice. And they essentially want to do an experiment. They want us to do it for free. I'm like, no. Because <laughs> the TV thing doesn't pay off. I don't get any more attention. I get some attention from it. It's the internet stuff. It's how they find me, and I get more stuff from the internet. But I realized I needed to go bigger to get this. Because I'm really interested in this. So I had to go to an industrial scale. It's a blast furnace, an iron, iron blast furnace. It's a pile of coke in there. The iron sits on top, and they, they layer it with iron coke, iron coke, and the coke burns down. There's forced air in here. Um, so it's the, it, it's the forced air with the coke that ignites this. It's about 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit in there. This is mine. This guy's only about 34 inches wide. And uh, it has this, you can't see it, but I used this laser thing. There's a big blower back here. It came out of a huge foundry in Syracuse. It was absolutely overpowered for this. <clears throat> this is shortly after I tapped it. And so it begins to look like those images of the stuff shooting up. Um, this lava in front is a good six to eight inches high. So I'm getting really close to this. Look at that. That's the cone. So this sample that's in the box right here is this piece right here. This thing actually started to build a cone in front of it and a pool of lava. The most lava I've ever seen outside a furnace was in front of it. This is a Oh, we, we uh, tapped this thing at 8.30 at night, and this is about midnight, and I realized I didn't have control of this. And I realized, like, this is what I want. This is what I've been looking for. And we're trying to beat down the sides of it. All it would do is this log would flow over the top where you would breach this, and it made it even stronger. So we just let it go. And then all the lava in there disappeared because it ran along. Let me go back here. It ran along this wall. There's a big metal wall up here that keeps the lava on that side and us on the other side and the sand on the lava side. It actually hit that metal and it heated up so quickly it bowed out and it tunneled under here. And I'd never seen it do that. And that's when I realized, like, this thing's alive and it's awesome. <laughs> I mean, this is six feet across. Karen will tell you we've never seen anything this wide and this thick, ever. Like, we, I, can, I can pour... I could pour maybe that much of it. Just thousands of pounds of material. I'm getting really close to that. This is Mount Etna, 2014. The name of this, my volcano, is my, my volcano, or volcano number one. This is my volcano. 
you the peace from me. <coughs> right? Oh, Jesus. Um, pretty close. There's some things about this that are not accurate. Um, it needs a little more time to do its thing in there, but Karen saw this uh, three weeks ago, wanted to know who had brought that to me from wherever, right? I said I didn't, I made that. I suspected it was, get, I've got close. I've gotten really close to where I wanted to be. That's what it looked like the next morning. This is about four and a half, five feet long. Okay, now to give you an idea of what this thing looks like. Here we go. It was windy. We had 30 to 50 mile an hour gusts of wind. It was pretty much like constant, 25 miles an hour. So the sound isn't great. But um, you'll see. There's no, I mean, the sound on this is terrible. Um, but it, it's. So that jet of hot out, that hot gas, uh, you know, that's coming out of there is about um, 3,000 degrees. And um, boy, did it run. That was something else I never expected. I think I have a longer version of that here. Um, here we go. I think this is it here. Yes. So, out to here, all the stuff we see from the is about 12,000 pounds of material that we made in less than four hours. Um, I think with this, I've gotten to the sublime. Uh, the sublime is, in my, in my definition of sublime, is the power and the fury, the terror, the, uh, uh, the beauty that is beyond description, and then just the whole, the grandeur of it that is beyond, that's outside our ability for our language to express all of it. So it's got to be that absolute, like, near death yet, full of life experience. And that was. And this thing was really, we just kept loading it and loading it and loading it. And it kept going and it was awesome. Alright. I'm almost there. And let me go back to this guy. This gives you an idea of how big this was the next morning. And so this, this lava right here is, this is about two and a half feet deep. This was his tougher field, or whatever, I don't, I guess. This was just a stack of all that stuff being shot out, built up, and this is how far out it flowed. This is three feet across, so this is a good 35, 36, 37 feet out here. Um, the lava is in these four foot by four foot bins, 1,800 pounds per bin. There's a couple hundred, 300 pounds of coke on top. That's what you see, the big chunks of coke. They're lifted uh, 10 feet up in there, and this is a giant box dumper that dumps it on this ramp, and uh, it was has to be pushed down in this thing. And the whole the height of this guy is um, it's about 22 feet tall. So you see the whole operation there. I couldn't hear it because I was so close, but when I tapped it, um, were you there when I tapped it? No. No. Apparently, this was a good 15 to 20 people deep. This is the next morning. This art festival goes from sundown on a Saturday to sunup on a, a Sunday. So yeah, sundown Saturday, sunup Sunday. And so there's somewhere between three to 4,000 people. <coughs> they, uh, there was a roar from the crowd. I couldn't hear. I mean, I was literally, I had my melon up near that thing digging out to uh, make it go. Because you plug it up at first with this clay. The lava builds up in there. The heat builds up. And when you tap it, it just shoots out. And, it, and you don't tap it again. It just does its thing. Um, so this, this was it. And this is, uh, gosh, I wish I had a picture. I was originally going for this, but I got here. Now, <laughs> <laughs> I 
make you laugh. <laughs> she knows. Uh, in the spring, and s this next spring and early summer, we're doing seven months. So, I wanted to be an astronaut. My dad, when this was happening, I think I was five, or I just turned five or six, sat me in front of a big zenith television. You have no idea what I just said by zenith. <laughs> There's a black and white, forget it. It was just this big box, and a picture came through, and there was no color, and we saw this. And I was like, anybody that's like 50 year old or could tell you it was unbelievable. Right? I mean, yes, there's got to be somebody over 50 now. <laughs> right? It was like, it was unimaginable. And they did it in five, six years? Seven years? Something like that when Kennedy said we're gone, right? I wanted to be that, and I wanted to go here, but I get to make this. This is from, I can't even remember the name of this because all my notes were lost with the crash. This is from an impact event where a meteor, you get a meteor strike into a planet and you see these exotic temperatures. So now, this summer I'm going to move from pouring 22 to 2300 degree lava to 4000 degree lava, which flows like rubbing alcohol. For a NASA, um, a NASA research grant with a, a young planetary volcanologist, Chris Hamilton, who's at the University of, of Arizona, when he came and when he first visited us three years ago, he was dressed in all black, much better clothing than this is. And he showed up, he looked at us like we were a bunch of hicks with a still. And then he saw the lava flow out, and he, I talked about that at the furnace before I built it. He was like, you're my guy. And everybody thought he was crazy. Well, we just got this NASA green, and we're going to make this super hot, exotic lava um, flow and using... Lunar, it's a lunar a simulant material that's mined, I think, in Virginia. Um, but we're going we're gonna to hit temperatures of 4,000 degrees, because that's the stuff they see temperatures up that high. I have not been able to make this, and everybody, all the earth science people are like, when are you going to do the ah, uh, ah? Uh? And I said, I don't know. It's really hard to make this. This I've not been able to make. I think I need a big, big furnace and a lot of material and a lot of time. I can make the stuff underneath all day long. The ah, ah, though, it's just got one letter in the name, but I'll tell you. It's <laughs> so when you saw that cannon shooting the stuff out, it actually made volcanic ash. You couldn't see it. It was nighttime. A bunch of other stuff came out of there too, like these bird's nests that pay his hair. And you get all the static electricity, you know, you get a lot of, in these eruptions where all the ash stuff's going to stack electricity and you have these lightning strikes and stuff. I know some guys, Nevada, they're going to hook me up and do this. I think this is actually a lot closer. Um, I've been thinking about a glacier. <laughs> Indoor glacier. <laughs> guy from Arizona to the NASA thing where he had to come up with a plasma dome to protect workers on the moon. He was a postdoc at NASA. Aurora Borealis. Imagine that in a nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> I, you would... <coughs> I want to make the Aurora Borealis. <laughs> Got to see where I am here on the slides. So, I actually think this is what I was really headed towards all along was this. And this, I don't even know who this is. And maybe, I want to, I, I don't know if it's Ken Sims or not, but uh, it's like, some yeah. volcanologist, um, which I think, for me, it's that. <laughs> and I think, I think, this might be my last slide. Yeah. I think it was in high school. High school, I read this, and I used to keep this written in, in, uh, in my wallet, and now I almost have it memorized. Probably the most... Um, I don't want to say it's, it's... It's just this is a Steve Jobs quote about loving what you do, and if you do it well enough, it'll carry you through. But this is... Um, yeah. And that's all I have. Bob. 
Really? It was that good or that bad? <laughs> Karen is going to tell me what the coke does to the lava because it looks the same, but I know there's other stuff going on because we use natural gas. Is that what you're doing now? I heard something like that when I was in there that you were like, this is what you can do. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Jeff, my, my colleague, he doesn't think there's much of a difference. If, it, if there is, it's not affecting much. He, he, he doesn't think. He's a structural geologist and smart guy, and I believe in him. He, uh, it's, I think the bigger issue is on, I hit such high temperatures in that, that blast furnace that that may have you know, changed things up. But um, the coke is made from high grade coal that they then use in the steel making business. That's what it, and it's a, it looks like pumice, it feels like pumice, it's got so much energy in it. Um, but that's just been with this recent thing. That other furnace runs on natural gas, just like a big old crock pot. <laughs> I mean, just natural gas crock pot. It's, it's got a ceramic lining, it's got this combustion chamber, this heating chamber, and then it's got this insulation. It's the same thing. It is, there's good reason people don't do this. It's so expensive. I went through six or seven crucibles this year. They're $2,500 a piece. And somebody asked, who asked if the university supports me? You did. I get natural gas, and that's about it. The rest I have to do, make money, research. I, not steal, but I... <laughs> Yeah, I do what you got to do sometimes. And, <laughs> or in the art world, it's called obtainium. <laughs> well, that's an obtainium. Um, and and uh, it is, um, it's really, it's been difficult. I missed, literally, from the time they were, they're 10 and 7 now, easily from when they were, the little one was one to my wife will tell you, I still haven't come home. Um, but I've missed like a good three years of their life, and I live a mile from the university. There were nights I'd stay up all night because that furnace, I couldn't figure out what it was doing. This summer, I had to pour every, every I was pouring twice a day for 90 days straight um, because I was melting down rock. I get it out of Wisconsin. It's, just, it's, a, it's a crushed up basalt, igneous rock that's super hard. It's supposed to be the hardest basalt in North America. And I was making six to seven hundred pounds of that a day that I would melt down and it's, it's actually this glass, the volcanic glass is what I put into the coke furnace. We have it, for me to melt down the gravel, I would have to have a machine that's so much more valuable and more sophisticated. Um, it's something I can't afford right now uh, to go straight from gravel to lava. So I have to go gravel in that crock pot thing, the natural gas thing, and to, to get to this. And um, it, it is... Yeah, it's just stupid. It's the whole thing. It's it's great, and I love it. But it, I'll be honest, it is so it's difficult. And like, as I said, a lot of my colleagues in the arts department, they I don't I don't know I don't know what they think. They don't really come around. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned uh, the supply and the <coughs> Yes. Whether a person was considering beauty, awesomeness in nature, or whether they were concrete nature, and I'm wondering how you see it. What are you doing? Are you a conqueror or are you an admirer? I think I think I'm in a really I think I'm I'm in a, involved in a dance that I don't understand all the moves, and I feel the word steward came up earlier this morning. I think I'm just. Uh, I'm not the master of it, and I, I see the power and the fury in it, I see the beauty in it, but I also see that I'm doing it, so it's, it's at both sides of the sublime. And it's interesting that the current Pope is turning out to look more and more like a transcendentalist with this, you know, that we have to be good stewards of the planet, which is weird to hear that out of that quarter, right? That this guy is saying, you know, this is our the mothership and we're telling it. Um, and I think... I don't know, because it's, 
Sublime was a word that was thrown around in art school a lot, and to the point of where it's, it's, it has no meaning anymore, and I, I purposely don't use it. And I'm trying to take on uh, the, I'm trying to take on the whole thing, and and create these things that um, when people see them or when I see them, I'm beyond speech. I'm terrified, but I'm also exhilarated that it, that I'm able to to witness this thing. I have yet to see a real lava flow. Um, well, they're real. Uh, but I have yet to go to a naturally occurring one, and I imagine that must be... I, yeah, I, I, I can't even imagine what that's like. Of what material are your crucibles? It's a, it is a graphite... It's a, um, a silicone graph... A silicon graphite. It has operating temperature up to 1650C, um, they uh, are primarily used for uh, bronze and aluminum. That, that was an old bronze furnace that I, small production bronze furnace. That changed. The people who make those, there's two companies not making them uh, anymore, they came and looked at it and they're like, we don't know what you're doing. No one does this to our crucibles. Like I break down crucibles like nobody's business. And um, so now, to get to that, 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 because that begs the, not the question is, well, how are you going to get to 4,000 degrees if you're at 30 to 3,100 degrees? We're, we're going to build a, a small transfer ladle that will be the size of a trash, small trash can that will hold about two cubic feet of material, and it's going to be made out of zirconia and, and a ceramic, and it can go up to, I think, 45, 4,600 degrees. So we'll pour this 2,000 degree stuff into it, and then we're going to put, um, it's either going to be butane or butane oxygen mix on top and just blast the living guts out of it to boost it to that temperature. Um, and those are, I'll get one, one shot out of each one of those and then I'll have to get another one. But those are handmade and I think they're a thousand bucks a piece. It's not that bad. Um, I learn a lot about materials, a lot about heat. I get burned still cooking tortillas at home. <laughs> I'm the lava guy, and I'm still like last night. So. I was going to ask, um, do you aim to get a certain temperature on the lava flows, or is it like, come what may? It was, when we were first doing it, it we were pouring it at like, it was hitting the sand at like 1250, 1275 C, which is 100 degrees more. And that was the first one that Karen saw that was like, you know, it doesn't happen this hot. And, and so I had to buy a FLIR. Um, and, and now I, and I can tell you now by looking at it, I looked at so much what temperature it is, by how fast it's flowing and the color of it. And it's, we always try to aim for 1175 C as it occurs in nature. Right? Is that like is that the benchmark or? Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, and um, but early on we were just turning that thing all the way up and thank we were just thank God it was coming out. Um, we tried to melt the stuff Palisade Sill, which is the stuff when you come out of out of Manhattan into <coughs> New Jersey. Uh, that stuff has a lower melt temperature but a higher viscosity, and that was just it killed a crucible, a brand new crucible out twenty five hundred bucks, nothing. And it's so frustrating. Um, it's it's uh, I'm this is like a low budget thing. This is so low. It's low budget. It's a problem with my wife because I've taken no money out of it, zero. Um, so there's no other question. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. um, you're trying to reproduce uh, the real thing. Yeah. Uh, but then you're making other music, right? Uh, are there people mining? I think the first, I do work with, with Ben Edwards, who's a Dickinson, he's a lot of ice interaction, that's his area of interest. Um, because it's so controlled, he's, I think he's gotten a lot of good data out of it, he's written one paper. Um, certainly the geophysicist, because it's also highly controlled. Um, she's got some good science out of it. 
It is. I'm waiting still for the science world to show up, more of it. <coughs> I went to the NSF and did a talk three years ago, right after we did a prototype furnace in a small co furnace. And I naively thought by going into the sciences, there's just going to be this truckload of money show up with it. And I just didn't know there's. It's not as bad as art, but it's not great. Right. It's so competitive, it's conservative in that they fund stuff that they know they're going to get a result out of. The people at, at NSF I was talking to, they were just, this is fantastic, this is awesome. They had a picture, that, they had a poster of a guy, of a painter, a landscape painter, an American from in this conference room. I said, this is it, this is what I'm trying to do. And they got it, but they, it, we have yet, we have, we've applied and failed six different times. Keep trying, but it is tough. I just I thought there'd be more money. Than there isn't. And so there's a lot of people that want to do stuff. There's a guy that studies trinitite, uh, which is the stuff that uh, Trinity, the first uh, um, atom bomb, was it atom, hydrogen or atom, atom bomb, was was blown up um, just before they dropped it on on Hiroshima. And so it, it made this lava like stone stuff, and he wants to come and try to replicate replicate that. So there's a lot, I get a lot of, you know, a lot of people want to do stuff. The guy from, uh, Chris Hamilton from Arizona and his NASA grant, this is going to be the first time we're really going, you know, for the winter, the uh, impact simulation. That's, I'm really excited. I'm excited about it. There's been a bunch of uh, conference presentations out of small projects. A like lot of conference presentations from the undergraduate yeah. to the postdoc to Jeff. And the educational <coughs> side, there's a huge education, but educational side is, right? How many kindergartners will ever get to see, or anyone will ever get to see real lava? And then trying to get funds for that, even to pay for the buses to bring them up to the university is impossible. It's really frustrating in that way. I've learned a lot about science and education and that. <coughs> when I was making those other objects before, I had no idea all this stuff. I just it was off my own little world. And it's been frustrating. But everybody that comes to see this, you know, are really into it. It's, uh, and there's, there's, but we haven't had that. I think this, I think, I hope Chris's paper, that when, you know, when he gets this in, it's going to change things. But it's still a couple of years out. So there's a reception upstairs, right? right. Sorry, right out here. Um, and I'm sure we can continue conversing there. So let's thank. Thank you all. all.